My name is Beth Kowalsik, and I am a member of Worthington City Council, and I'll be your MC tonight. So uh, bear with me. I've not done live and streaming before, so this will be very interesting. But let's take a quick look at tonight's agenda. We have three featured speakers uh, to talk about the history of planning and development in Worthington and how it fits into the national context. And that will be followed by a moderated Q&A session. For the online audience, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen during the program. The City of Worthington is one of the lead sponsors of the Building Inclusive Communities Initiative, which seeks to expand positive conversations about solutions to our region's housing challenges and our extreme geographic and economic segregation in Central Ohio. It speaks volumes to the importance of these issues that Building Inclusive Communities has two dozen sponsors and partner organizations, including forward-thinking municipalities, such as the City of Worthington and the City of Bexley. And I'd like to talk about why the City of Worthington and Worthington City Council has joined this initiative. Our city's community-led Vision Worthington initiative with the feedback of 300 community members at public events and over 2000 members online and in surveys, developed seven vision statements that encapsulate what we want Worthington to be. Being a diverse, inclusive and equitable community is one of the seven statements and really informs the other six as well. And you can find those on visionworthington.org if you wanna learn more about our visioning process. City Council has prioritized Worthington becoming an inclusive community, particularly through our adoption of a more inclusive non-discrimination ordinance, our joining the national network of age-friendly communities, and adopting source of income non-discrimination legislation. Worthington has the highest percentage of older residents in our community compared to other Central Ohio communities. And one of the things we have heard loud and clear is the strong desire to be able to continue living and thriving in our community here as we age, but there are limited housing options to do so. Our economic stability depends on a strong workforce, but without a range of affordable housing options, our economic development will suffer. And finally, a diverse and inclusive community allows us all to learn from each other and to basically be better humans. And I think that's something we really need right now. So let's turn to our three speakers. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, tonight, we have three experts to share with us the history of planning and development in Worthington and how it fits into the national context and into our desire to build inclusive communities. And I've seen the slideshow and it's really cool. First up will be Kate Lalonde, who's the executive director of the Worthington Historical Society. Kate has been with the Historical Society for more than 11 years, eight of those as the director. She holds two degrees from the University of Michigan, one in French language and literature, and one in dance. Kate will be followed by Lee Brown, who has served as our city's director of planning and building for the city of Worthington for more than eight years. Lee previously held planning roles with both Franklin County and Licking County, and he earned his master's degree in city and regional planning from Ohio State. And rounding out our speakers will be Dr. Bernadette Hanlon, who is an Ohio State University professor, as well as chair of the bachelor's degree program in city and regional planning. Dr. Hanlon earned her PhD from University of Maryland and teaches planning courses and studios, including a focus on housing policy and planning. Last year, she was appointed as the editor of the Journal of Urban Affairs. So let's get started. Kate, you can kick us off with our program on Worthington's early history. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, so yeah, as Beth mentioned, I will start off chatting about um, the early Worthington history, how we got here, um, and how the community was shaped early on. And when we refer to um, Worthington as having a New England feel, why is that? So um, before I delve into the modern Worthington history, I guess I always do like to mention that uh, the Worthington folks that settled came in 1803 were not the first people here. Um, the Jeffers Mound on Pleasanton Drive is the last remnants left of a large earthwork that is thought to be built by Hopewell. P. 
people um, about 2,000 years ago. And you can see the in the 1848 map, the large rectangular earthwork, um, the mound that's left is just the part that's at the bottom, on the bottom line. Um, so, and then after the Hopewell people, we know there are Wyandotte people in the area, as long as other indigenous tribes. Um, so, well, then moving back to uh, how Worthington became a town. Uh, in 1802, the Scioto Company was organized by people in Connecticut and Massachusetts, led by James Kilborn. Um, the people who were looking to come west were looking for inexpensive land that would offer more opportunity than was available in the east. And um, so Worthington and the town that they imagined is a classic example of a covenanted community. Uh, that was bound in a social compact between God and with each other, and that is explicitly laid out in the Articles of Agreement for that company. And the company, the style of company moving west was really popular. Um, there, the Scioto Company is certainly not unique in what they did, um, but they were kind of unique in that they did limit uh, membership to the Scioto Company to people who planned to settle here, uh, they did not allow people who were speculators to participate and come here and purchase land. Um, but they were cautious. They were organized. They waited to make a purchase of land until they knew that Ohio was going to be a state. Um, when in 1802, the year before they purchased land, two people, James Kilborn and Nathaniel Little, came to Ohio and uh, to scout out what land they would purchase and um, met with Thomas Worthington. They ended up looking at area, the Chillicothe area and Franklinton, um, but when they went back, recommended actually purchasing land north of where they ever got to visit because the high banks was, were better, had better drainage and less chance of sickness from swamp lands. So that's how they ended up purchasing 16,000 acres for $1.25 an acre. Um, there were two parcels outside of Sharon Township um, that they planned on selling to raise money for their uh, new town. And then they planned to site Worthington in the 8,000 acres uh, that made up the west side of Sharon Township. And the local government was already in place when they arrived. Um, so I have two maps that were ones from 1803 and ones from 1804. The one on the left shows the whole west side of Sharon Township with the town of Worthington, um, the dense part down here. And then that's the large map that was drawn of just the town. So even though they bought the whole west half of Sharon Township, the town of Worthington was just considered inside morning, evening, um, north and south streets. And so that's a modern map of that original town. They divided the town lot town into 160 lots. They reserved five acres in the middle that would remain unencumbered by buildings or fences. Um, and then set aside two lots, B and C for the church and two for um, the school, which were D and E. So the Kilbourne Middle School is still on that original school lot and St. John Episcopal is still on the original church lot. And also, it's interesting to note, in 1803, they arrived here, the Scioto Company arrived, 41 subscribers um, were part of the company, and their families came, 100 people got here the first year, they stopped on the way so James Kilborn's wife could have a baby, and got to an even 100. Um, <laughs> he was apparently happy about that, it was something he noted. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, so then... Uh, just seven years later, Worthington actually attempted to win the bid to be the state capital of Ohio when they moved the capital to central Ohio. Um, there were Columbus, Dublin, and Worthington were the contenders. Columbus didn't have anything built yet, so um, it was easier to start from scratch. But I do think it's interesting that in 1810, 136 people pledged $25,000 plus land so that the capital could, to try to entice them to bring to the capital to Worthington, which would have completely obviously changed what we would be talking about today. Um, especially when the purchase of all 16,000 acres was only $20,000. Uh, that's a substantial sum. 
Um, I included a couple buildings. The Kilbourn Commercial Building was built in 1808, still standing on High Street. Um, a good example of the architectural style that the Scioto Company brought with them, um, federal architecture. That was also happened to be the home of Franklin County's first newspaper, the Western Intelligencer, that was published in that building. Um, we've got the Griswold Tavern, which was on the Village Green from 1811 until 1965. Um, just an, kind of an institution that a lot of people remembered after it was torn down for a while. Uh, and then this map shows the plat for the Worthington Manufacturing Company, which was on the um, east side of the Whetstone or Olentangy River, the area we now know as Fox Lane. And um, this also helps see the vision of what James Kilborn really was hoping for his new town. He planned to establish the manufacturing company um, that would supply, or they, he would bring together a lot of craftspeople, tanners, shoemakers, coopers, um, cabinet makers. Orange Johnson came to be a comb maker there. And that all these craftspeople would use the natural resources that the West could provide and send goods back East. And so he planned, his Kilborn's hope was that they would have a chain of stores all the way up to Sandusky and be able to sell and then ship goods east through Lake Erie. Um, the, the company collapsed in 1820. And um, at that point, there were 18 buildings on the Mechanic Square. Uh, the only building left now is the boarding house that um, housed single people who were here um, to participate in that company. And let's see. Okay, so then um, in, by 1826, after the manufacturing company had collapsed, Kilborn was still working on ways to keep uh, Worthington connected to, you know, into the national scene. So he really lobbied for the development of the Columbus and Sandusky Turnpike. It was incorporated in 1826. He was the surveyor and Orange Johnson was the superintendent. And you can see that um, before that there was a path that was not straight, um, a straight shot to Lake Erie. So he planned to have the road be 20 miles shorter and also go through towns he platted like Norton and Bucyrus and other places, um, which was convenient. Uh, but it turns out there was a reason that those Indian trails went out of the way because it was so wet and marshy that the road was pretty much a failure from the get-go. It was under budget when they finished it, but they didn't use, they used logs to make a corduroy road instead of stone, and it was a muddy mess forever. Um, so in 1835, the town incorporated, the um, government structure changed to a mayor and five trustees, and 20, uh, 25, 30 years after they got here, the population was 314 in 1830. 440 in 1840. So I included some maps um, just to see how the growth of Worthington happened over time. In 1842, you can still see um, what was Worthington proper and then the manufacturing company there. And then all the farmland around was owned by people, some of whom did have town lots in Worthington, um, but it was still very rural, um, very, sparsely developed outside of the town. Um, in 1851, the Clum Columbus, let's see, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati Railroad passed one mile east uh, and that helped move industry east of the city um, and also led into um, development moving east of the town. Um, also just mentioned the omnibus came through in 1853 and stopped at the Worthington Inn, um, and which was the Union Hotel at that time. And it was advertised that you could now get to Columbus via stagecoach in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so really making commute more appealing. <laughs> Um, and then I like this map in, uh, from 1856. I have another close up. I'll, I think the next one's even more helpful. They're all the little tiny um, squares are houses. And you can pretty much see that people are still just living along the Columbus Sandusky Turnpike. And most of the area was farmland and um, you know, people were congregating towards the middle 
Um, and then that is the town um, in 1856 with all the structures. And then in 1856, they also, anna Worthington annexed the Morris edition, uh, and that was bounded by today's Granville Road, South Street, um, Morning Street, and Andover. And that was, um, that annexation was divided into 160 lots that were each a half acre. And um, it's thought Uriah Heath was a Methodist minister who lived on the Village Green. And it's thought, it's been said that he orchestrated the development of this neighborhood and at least in part to get, offer free, free Blacks and retired Methodist ministers a place to buy their own land and um, build their own houses. And so I've been working on studying that, studying who actually lived there. And from 1856 to 1900, at least 20 of the 160 lots, or 20% of the 160 lots were owned by African Americans. And um, they made up about 6% of the population of Worthington. So it does seem that that's significant, primarily along Plymouth, where the St. John African Methodist Episcopal Church was eventually built. <laughs> Um, 1870, the municipal code for Ohio changed, so the government changed again to the mayor-council format. Uh, here's an 1872 map. Worthington still looks the same, basically, as it did in 1842, with the exception of the Morris edition being added on. Again, 1883, still pretty much the same. Uh, and then I liked looking at the population from 1800 to 1900, because you can see from 1830 to 1900, it just bobbed between 314 and um, 484 in 1850, but it basically stayed flat. In fact, in 1880, the um, spike can be attributed to the Ohio Central Normal School being open in 1880, which drew in, they had about 100 students. Um, I also included this just, I think it's interesting to look about what people were talking about change in 1887. Um, they were talking about old phobiaism and when Worthington fell into its <laughs> present comatose condition many years ago from a broken heart because of its failure in getting the capital established here, it was thought it had received its death blow, but it is useless to oppose the inevitable. Columbus is a bigger elephant than we are. And if she chooses to push her proboscis along <laughs> North High Street and clear the right way for a streetcar track, she is bound to do it sometime. And then in the same paper, they were also noting that Elmwood, which is now Linworth, was doing better in improvement than Worthington. Why? Because they have not contracted the disease of old phobiaism. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> in 1893, a significant development for Worthington was um, the right-of-way being granted for the electric streetcar to come up High Street. Uh, cars came from Columbus through Plainville and turned around in the public square. Eventually, track was extended, so it connected um, Columbus, Delaware, and Marion through Worthington. And uh, definitely, that had an impact on population. Um, after the railway got here, it increased to 705. Uh, and then the last thing I'll chat about a little bit is Colonial Hills, just um, because I think it's, um, it, there are a few different developments all happening at the same time, but it's a good one to look at. Uh, it was originally plotted in 1927, and the picture from the newspaper on the right shows what the homes were planned to look like, and they did get a few homes built before the depression, but then the development stalled out, and that happened in a number of neighborhoods. Um, original deed restrictions included that homes would not be valued less than $4,000, ownership was restricted to Caucasians, and the, they prohibited businesses that would not be desirable for good residential neighborhoods. Um, but then, because the um, subdivision was stalled out. In 1941, the Defense Homes Corporation took over, but uh, lowered the cost of the project. Um, the federal gov government had recognized a lack of suitable housing for executives that were engaged in the war production in Columbus. So the Curtis Wright aircraft plant um, on Columbus East Side at the airport created, because it had created an unprecedented demand for housing. So um, the DHC 
planned and announced that they would build 225 homes in the new Colonial Hills and Sub Dales subdivision. And most of the homes were actually prefabricated offsite uh, in New York and brought by railroad. It was one of the first developments to use um, sheetrock instead of plaster so that they could build the homes faster. Um, and they had nine homes designed by a Columbus architect and just, they knew some homes would always be on the corner. Some models were only at the front. So the neighborhood looked a little bit squishier um, and just built those nine models so they could build really quickly. Um, and the rent, originally the homes were rentals for workers at Curtis Wright. And then later were sold to returning veterans and current residents for about six to $8,000 per house. Um, so by World War II, the population was 1,500. And then at the end of um, Colonial Hills being developed, although Colonial Hills was in, not in Worthington that whole through its development, Worthington was 2,500. And um, they voted in 1954, a very contentious issue of whether or not to annex Colonial Hills into Worthington or not. And if you read the newspapers, people were, um, proponents and opponents were very vocal and very critical of each other, um, but they did decide to annex in and the population instantly jumped because Colonial Hills was actually bigger than Worthington. The population jumped past 5,000 so that Worthington became a city. And so that's when the charter was adopted for city council, city manager government. And then that kind of gives you an idea of what happened post-World War II and will lead into what we can share with you about all the building and subsequent zoning that came next. Thanks. Hey. Thank you, Kate. Um, it's always good to see everyone actually in person again, so it's, it's kind of nice. Again, I'll quickly go through this. A lot of it's gonna you know, hit on um, a little bit of what Kate's already talked about and then to where we are to today. Again, starting where Kate mentioned, we originally you know, founded in 1803. We now have a population of a little under 15,000 and we're five and a half square miles. We're a landlocked community. But as Kate mentioned, we started off in 1803 with 100 people. So we've come a long way since then. One of the things to, to let you know is Worthington is one of the, the first planned communities. Um, as Kate mentioned, with our village green, we have a three and a half acre village green and an acre and a half for schools and churches and 160 residential and commercial lots that are the original part of Old Worthington. And again, with Old Worthington, one of the unique things, as, as Kate mentioned, some of this will overlap, is it does is bounded by morning, evening, and north and south, and was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2010. Kind of a, a long list for us, kind of our, our planning history. Um, as again, we were found in 1803, officially became a village in 1835. We adopted our first zoning ordinance in 1928, which is really significant because back in 1926, there was a famous court case for the planning nerds in the group of Euclid versus Ambler Realty that kind of um, legalized that zoning was actually legal to do. So we were one of the first communities to adopt zoning. We did our first land use plan in 1950. Um, again, when Colonial Hills was annexed, we exceeded the population of 5,000 and officially became a city in 1954. And then again, our first planning commission was created in 1958. Um, 1964 and 66 led into um, what we think of as a true comprehensive plan, a planning document for our community as we would grow. A plan for all the areas that we now know as Worthington or Sharon Township, um, Perry Township and portions of Columbus at that time. Um, Kate mentioned the Griswold. Um, that was one of the reasons that kind of led into when it was demolished, it led into the creation of the Arctic Review District and um, the Arctic Review Board, which was established in 1967. And this is always an interesting one. Um, the zoning code that we have today was actually adopted in 1971. However, there's been several amendments and modifications to it over the years. However, the base of it is from 1971, which is when I was born. So it's always kind of interesting. Um, you know, continuing our theme of, of planning and planning for the future, 
We did a 1988 comprehensive plan update to that 1966 one. 2005, we did a complete overhaul of the plan and did a strategic plan um, for the community. And at the same time, also adopted Worthington design guidelines for our historic district and our architecture review district. Until that time, um, when it was created in 1967, it was a board that reviewed, but this actually gave guidelines um, for development. And again, 2010, we did a community visioning. Um, it's the Worthington Area 360 that partnered with the schools and the libraries at that time, kind of what do we want to be when we grow up? And then in 2010, and again, we became National Register for Historic Places for our historic district. Continue our planning themes. We kind of evolved from our citywide comp plan to looking at our corridors. So we looked at the Wilsbridge corridor study from river to rail, what we wanted that to, to be had developed in the, you know, the 60s and 70s. What did we plan for it to be as it, you know, revitalized? And then, um, hate to mention it, but the 2014 UMCH focus area study for the property across the street from City Hall, we did an update to that plan. Uh, and then in 2021, we did Vision Worthington, which Ms. Kwasik mentioned earlier. And then 2022, we did a, an amendment to the UMCH focus area. So the long history of planning documents and zoning that we've really relied on, one of the unique things I'll, before I get off this slide, is in the 1971 zoning code, one of the things that was unique is that it referenced for all the residential lots, you had to have 1600 square foot minimum household for any new lots, but existing lots, you had to have at least a 1200 square foot house you know, being built, which is really unique because where I live in Clintonville, my house is a thousand square feet, 1100 square feet, and it's big for me. So we built in you know, zoning requirements for minimum, minimum house sizes. Again, just kind of a menagerie of our, our planning documents that we have and that we rely on for our boards and commissions to reference and our council members to reference. Again, Kate touched a lot on kind of our annexation history. You can really see a lot of how we grew. Um, many of you know, Columbus controls the water and sewer in the region. Um, so to be able to annex, you have to, to annex for water and sewer, you have to annex into a, into a municipality. So for Worthington, we were completely surrounded by Sharon Township and Perry Township. So as, as those properties would develop and they wanted central utilities, they would have to annex into, um, into Worthington. Um, one of the unique things, at least looking at this map, is kind of our last really big annexations for Worthington before we were kind of completely landlocked was over on the west side. Um, many of you may know it as um, Pleasanton, Castle Crest, or Potter's um, Creek. It's really the last areas that really annexed in. We've had small ones here and there, but those are the primary annex and annexations. And then since I'm still on this map, um, the area that's towards the top of the screen, the, the brown tan area, that is Worthington States, Worthington States East, Worthington Way. It's kind of really what doubled the city in size. But also when you look to the, the Southeast portion, um, as Kate mentioned with Colonial Hills, at that time it, it doubled our city in size and land area also. Kind of looking through our population, a little bit overlap with Kate, but it's kind of amazing that, you know, originally we started with hundred people and now we're at almost 15,000 people, but you can really see where it ebbed and flowed and you know, from 1950 of 2,100 residents to the 1960 of jumping over 9,000. And that was, you know, attributed to the annexation of Colonial Hills. Again, Kate had, you know, touched on the Morris edition. That was really the, the first true annexation just east of Old Worthington into the city. I know this isn't Worthington, but it, Worthington completely surrounds Riverly. But one of the things you know we did want to point out is what's interesting with Riverly is it was originally platted in 1924. However, it was never incorporated into a village until 1939. It was platted with um, 254 residential lots originally. Then I'm not going to hit on every neighborhood, so I apologize, especially to Beth um, in Worthington. But I do know it all if you want to know. Um, but Davis Estates is down by our cemetery. It was actually, you know, platted in 1926, has frontage over onto High Street, going toward the cemetery, um, but it was actually annexed into the city of Worthington in 1954, and it had 134 lots when it was originally constructed. Colonial Hills, I think Kate gave the highlights on Colonial Hills, but it was, you know, what's always unique with Colonial Hills, it was developed in Sharon Township, then you know, annexed decades later into the city, which is you know, really what pushed us into becoming a city. And it was 873, you know, residential lots at the time. 
I'll go through that. Medic Estates, actually just north of here, a couple hundred feet is Medic Estates. Um, the original Boulder Lodge was in 1929, but in 1941, the owner of all this property towards the river decided to subdivide it to where we eventually have 74 lots today. And again, many of you, if you drive on that street on Tucker, you'll notice the when it was originally platted from the Boulder Lodge to the river, there was like a stair step and setbacks. Our thought is, you know, not perfect records, but it was probably to preserve that view of the lodge, you know, towards the river as you as you go west towards the floodplain. Then again, bouncing along to Rush Creek, um, it's on the National Register of Historic Places in 2003, developed in 1954, originally had 48 homes, uh, 51 homes today. One of the unique things is with this neighborhood, it's completely controlled by deed restrictions. The city can enforce the zoning regulations for it and the platting regulations, but any of the deed restrictions is by the HOA. So any modification or change has to go to their HOA for approval. Kilbourne Village, this is one I find interesting um, just south of here. It was actually the original Episcopal Church farm. So we'll see a theme of, you know, churches owning farmland that gets developed, but it was annexed in 1955 and developed in 1959, but it was 83 acres that was purchased for $260,000 for all that acreage. So it was kind of, you know, neat to see that. Has 184 lots today. Homes range in 1300 square feet, 1800 square feet in size. But I found some, I don't know if Kate knows this, but found some reference that Simsbury Drive was actually, you know, someone's handwritten notes that actually was supposed to be Simsbury Drive and Farrington was supposed to be Farmington. So it's, it was probably someone trying to read my handwriting back in the day, <laughs> but they realized to be able to change it, it was too costly to do any of the changes. So they just kept the names. Um, Kate had mentioned Pleasanton earlier, um, wherever Je where Jeffers Mound is. Again, it developed in the mid 50s to the mid 60s, 35 homes today that are all single family. Originally it was all developed in Sharon Township. This is one portion of our community that's still, the majority of it is on septic systems, but they do have central water. This is where we really grew. In 1956, that whole area north of Worthington annexed in um, to Worthington to start development. So Worthington Estates um, came in line, line in 1959. One of the interesting things with that is the average house price was to be $18,000. And this also was worth in the States East, which is on the east side of High Street. And this is actually portions of this are the former children's home property for the Methodist Children's Home. Worthing Way, um, just to the south of Worthington Estates, just north of Medic, was platted in 1963. And then going through the records, it has 326 lots. And it was actually a, built as a transition from the nicer homes in Medic Estates to the newer homes being built in um, Worthington Estates. It's kind of that, that buffer between the $18,000 homes and the, the nicer homes on, on Medic. And again, one of the unique things history-wise with this is this is what Evening Street connected to Evening Street out here um, in Old Worthington. That was a big controversy at the time where a lot of the residents in Old Worthington did not want the connection of Evening Street going up into Worthington Estates, and those of you that know Worthington Estates today, there's really only three main entrances in off of High Street, Wilson Bridge Road, to get to, Met, to, get to Worthington Estates. So I can't really imagine that connection not being there today. Tollgate, this is a, an interesting one. It's actually just north of the Orange Johnson House. You can see the Orange Johnson House referenced on here. On High Street, it was one of the first condominiums platted in Franklin County. So that's their one of their claims to fame. It was a, a 20 unit, 55 and older at the time. Um, condominium kind of set the tone for what I understand of how condominiums would develop and how they were recorded at Franklin County. Um, several other the big condominiums that we have in Worthington is Worthing Glen, which is right at um, Crandall and Worthington Lena Road. It's 72 units just behind City Hall in the firehouse. Again, jumping over to the west side of town, west of the river, we have Shaker Square. Um, it was platted around an acre and a quarter park, um, was annexed in 1959, developed in 1966, and there's 61 homes with a, a central park around it, accessed off of Olentangy River Road. Olentangy Hills is what a lot of people still think of as Worthington Estates. It's just that northern portion of the northwest portion up towards um, Wilson Bridge Road. 178 lots, and it was annexed in 1956, but developed in 1968. 
And then Ville Charmant was actually built as kind of a, another buffer area transition from the Worthington Estates home, the Old Tangy Hills homes, to the commercial development that was happening and office development that was happening on the north side of East Wilson Bridge at that time. 156 units. Um, one of the unique things with Villa Charmont, uh, it's an all electric community. They don't have gas to it. So all the homes are operated by electric and it's a mix of two and three bedroom. So Potter's Creek is an interesting one. This is on the west side of town, uh, west side of Linworth Road. It's probably what I would call Worthington's last true big subdivision. We've had several, you know, 10, 12, maybe 14 acre lot subdivisions, but this is probably the last true big subdivision we had. Started in 1977 um, and in the 1981 was the former owner of Potter's Lumber over on the east side of town, has 134 lots. And then again, over on the west side off of Olentangia Road is Bainbridge Condominiums, 26 unit condominium um, with two private residences towards the west. Westbrook Price, uh, 18 lot subdivision off of Linworth Road. And then Kenyon Brook was probably the, the last big development that happened closer to Old Worthington. This is the area just west of uh, Colonial Hills. There's three original houses on the north side of, of Kenyon Brook. And then it, it was platted off um, for the additional lots in 1987. And this also is also included in our Artistic Review District. Kate touched a little bit on transportation. Again, in 1893, we had the Worth of Columbus Streetcar, 1901 to 1933, through the Columbus Delaware Marion Interurban Railway, which is for many of you that are in Worthington, it's the, the railway line over by the Railway Museum that would actually come up and connect it over to High Street where O'Reilly Family Pharmacy is. So if you're on the lots north of North Street in Wilson, it, would, it used to be an old right of way that would connect you over to, to High Street. Then there were a lot of private bus companies in the day. Then Coda came around in 1971. And then we got I-270 that kind of really blocked us from any growth to the north. And then we had 315 constructed during the late 70s to 1980. Just a few aerials, just to kind of show you, they're a little grainy, so I apologized, how we developed over time. And then this is our, our current aerial, as you can see. We look much greener in this one, so. <laughs> but again, you know, where we are today, coming from 100, 100 population to a little under 15,000, we've got a little under 6,000 housing units. However, predominantly 85% of our housing units are single family with the other 15% being multifamily. Again, we're five and a half square miles in size, fully developed, fully developed. so any opportunities we have is, would be with redevelopment. Again, we've got our zoning map that was pretty much set in 1971. It's evolved over time, um, but the basis was set in 1971. Again, with our existing land uses, as I mentioned with Worthington, 60% of our land is dedicated to single family, maybe 4% for multifamily. Um, commercial use is a little over 7%. Industrial use is a little over 11%, but you can see you know, a large predominant portion is, is single family. 221 acres of park space, 16 different parks. We've got a large community center and the Griswold Center. Again, one of the unique things with Worthington, as many other communities, we do have our architectural review district, which is the heart is old Worthington. And then everything along High Street and along 161 is in the architectural review district. So citywide, we have over 5,500 parcels. As I mentioned, 4,600 of those are single family, but in the architectural review district, whether it be commercial or residential, we've got 829 properties. And then Old Worthington itself makes up 372 properties. So this was a funny one of, of you that have you've been following kind of what's been going on in Worthington. Um, City Council a few weeks ago passed um, a deer feeding ordinance, but it was kind of funny to look back in 1808 to see what the, the highlights and the issues were. We had a squirrel issue. So back in 1808, there was a squirrel tax that was imposed that I guess almost you know, 1,300 squirrels were you know, put to their timely death, but it was, you had to pay a tax of three cents per squirrel or you had to bring in a squirrel. Um, so 
it's a little interesting to see, you know, you flash forward 214 years later to 2022 and, you know, the, the slide on the screen is across from City Hall, the children's home, and you see all the deer walking and crossing the, the property. So what's old is new again, 214 years later. So with that, I will zip it and turn it over to Bernadette. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, inviting me here today. I'm a, um, a professor in the City and Regional Planning Program, as uh, has been mentioned, but I'm also a resident of Worthington, so I'm very happy to, to come here uh, and talk to you today. So what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit uh, more of a, a national picture, if you like, of what's been happening in suburbs more broadly, um, and sort of have maybe raised some things for Worthington to think about. Um, when it when it starts to think about how it's changing and evolving. So, um, oh, well, I'm just gonna go through my name again. <laughs> sorry, sorry, guys. Um, so, what is it? So, is it not, it's just gonna stick on my name, but here we go. Um, just hit the down button, no. There's some problem. One more time. Okay. Okay. So as, as people have been mentioning sort of the evolution of, of, of Worthington, it's been really interesting to hear how it's annexed. And I just wanted to show you guys, this is the age of the housing stock, what the majority of the housing stock. So it's really been built sort of like 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, right? It was when most of Worthington it was sort of built out, right? Um, and this is sort of a story that I think is not unique to Worthington. A lot of suburbs evolved um, during the kind of post-war period. Um, sorry, I don't know. So this is an aerial shot of Levittown in Pennsylvania. Um, and Le there's a Levittown also in New York. And this is sort of seen as a classic kind of post-war suburb, right? And so a lot of suburbs were developing during this time period. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail on it, but very much um, this, this occurred because of federal housing policies and as well as federal policies related to transportation. So um, investments in, in highways and so on. So sort of leading to uh, the suburbanization, it didn't just kind of occur right, randomly, it was very much influenced by federal policies and federal policies around mortgages and insuring mortgages and therefore freeing up banks to actually give out more mortgages to folks who were maybe not as wealthy as those original kind of first uh, people moving out into the suburbs initially. So they were kind of uh, um, allowing for more working class, middle class folks to purchase homes. Um, there's a long history about this that I'm not gonna go into, but very much kind of allowed for white folks to move out into the suburbs. And so this is why we sort of have a white this suburbanization during this time period. So what's kind of, I think, one thing to think about for Worthington. So this is your typical kind of image of suburbia, right? It's sort of like this track development, very automobile dependent, right? And a lot of these early suburbs didn't really have a center. So I think one thing to think about for Worthington is it does have this historic kind of center, which I think is really important. And we can get into that a little bit later. So another uh, thing to think about though, with this image that we might have of suburb suburbs is that they're all the same, right? There's a sort of homogeneity to the suburbs. Well, actually suburbs are very different. So we sort of have a, um, there, there's a lot of different kinds of suburbs out there. And so there's the older planned suburbs, which in part like Worthington might fit into that in its early history, um, but also places like Roland Park in Baltimore, that's a classic kind of older planned uh, suburban community. There's also, and, and this is not told that much, but there's an unplanned kind of self-built suburbs. There were a lot of, and there's some really interesting work on Canada, for example, um, that, that where people went out and built their own homes and created the suburbs in a much more in, uh, unplanned kind of manner. And, um, you know, this, this was sort of sometimes a more working class kind of group uh, who may have been doing this. 
there's also um, what has been this sort of evolved really starting in the 80s and 90s when you see a lot of office development going out into the suburbs and a lot of uh, employment going out into suburbs where uh, you, you see the emergence of employment centers kind of out in the periphery. So it's not just the city anymore, but there's also these what they call edge cities. And so you can think of Dublin as a kind of good example of an edge city here in uh, Columbus. Then of course we have what they describe as kind of exurban development, right? So, so Worthington is really an older suburb, right? And then you got continued kind of suburbanization all the way out even to the kind of rural kind of urban interface. So there's very different kind of issues out there, right? As opposed to what may be happening here in Worthington. And then I think this is sort of what I want to talk a little bit about this uh, in, in a couple of slides, but there's also now some really interesting work that's looking at immigrants and how they're changing suburban communities. And a, a lot of this probably is more sort of in places like in California, for example, where you may have had immigrants that had changed urban environments, right, and created urban uh, places like Little Italy or Chinatown or wherever. Now there are these Chinatowns, you know, in, in suburban communities, and they're often described as kind of ethno or, or ethnic suburbs. So one of the things that's been happening, so over time, and then this is, this is just data going back to, 19, to 2010, but you see this sort of really starting probably in the 1980s and 1990s in particular, where you see a sort of much more suburban diversity happening, right? So this idea of white suburbia is really evolving, right? And changing. And so the share, uh, this, is a, this is sort of a national picture, right? This is not Worthington, this is just a nat na na national kind of picture here. So the share of the population of people in color has been going up over time and actually kind of almost stagnating in cities, right? And so this is sort of an interesting phenomenon and sort of, Similarly, we might have an image in our mind of suburbs as places where, you know, um, the kids and married with kids and the woman stays at home and takes care of the kids. This is not happening in suburbs, just as equally as it's not happening in, in cities, right? Women are out working uh, in both of these kinds of environments, uh, probably a little less so in the suburbs, but still uh, the majority of women out working. And then the share of immigrants is also almost equal now between the cities and, and the suburbs. And one of the things that's happening in, in this context is that um, immigrants, the story of America is really about immigrants coming to cities and then moving out into the suburbs once they kind of become some more socially mobile or their kids might go out there. But actually what's happening now is immigrants are moving directly into suburban communities and kind of bypassing uh, cities altogether. So um, there's also this issue of aging in the suburbs. And so again, Worthington is not completely unique in this regard. And so this is the change in um, the, the uh, population 65 and older just over the last few years, right? From 2010 or from 2000 to 2016. So what's happening is the suburbs are aging a little bit faster and more rapidly than other places. And so this is something to really uh, not unique again to kind of Worthington. And this is leading to a kind of a rise in a multi-generational family system and people living in multi-generational households. And this is sort of, this has been going on since the 80s, but is kind of anticipated to keep going. And so I wanted to probably address some of this in a few minutes in terms of how this might affect urban form, for example. Another thing that I think is interesting, and this is a national picture, it's not just suburbs, but Household arrangements are very different, right, to what they were in the past. So this is households that are aged between 23 and 38, right, years of age. Back in 1968, right, when the suburbs were really developing and Worthington are growing too, about 70% of that age group were married with children, right? Now that's down to like about 29%. So much of this age group, right, are actually... Um, may be married with no children, they may be, uh, be single parents, they may be living with their own parents still, <laughs> they may be with, living with other family members, right? So we built the suburbs for this kind of group in a way, and now this group has really shrunk and has, or has become a, a very 
different kind of um, uh, arrangements, right, that are going on. So what does this mean for suburban kind of development and how we built suburban communities, right, mostly around married with children kind of um, uh, groups. Another phenomenon that's been happening is that uh, poverty in the suburbs has been increasing. And this has been, uh, so these are raw numbers, right? So there's actually more poor people now living in suburbs in the United States than living in urban areas. And it's been the case since 2000, they sort of, um, uh, it outgrew what was happening in, in, in cities. So suburbs evolve and change and they take on different forms. And what I wanna sort of talk about next is sort of how they might evolve in terms of their form, right? Um, and so we could think about this in terms of when, if Worthington has probably done some of this already, but also you can imagine when demand gets really high, right? For, and you can think about sort of Intel coming and what's this gonna mean. So some of these things could, ha could really uh, escalate, right? So, so this is sort of a, a picture of, a, of, of Levittown in New York, uh, where the house on the right here is uh, what it looks like now. And then on the left, what it might've looked like back in the day. So we've added a kind of new floor. So this is evolving and changing. These, this housing stock doesn't stay the same. Sometimes people have knocked down and rebuilt these things and not in often, this is a little bit obnoxious uh, example of this, <laughs> but um, this is Arlington, Virginia. And so the planning department in Arlington, Virginia had to try to figure out what to do about this, right? But they knocked down the original home and built this massive uh, structure. And this is often called mansionization, right? This is what they kind of describe it as. So you kind of want the closeness of being close to DC in this case, but also the big, biggest house you can have, right? So th th this is sort of like a, an issue that, that that's actually not just happening in the United States, but actually in Australia, they call it knock down and rebuild in Australia, but this is something that we could be thinking about if, how do we want, do we want to see homes being knocked down and rebuilt with bigger structures and how, how would that, what would that do? And in some cases, um, what I did some, some work on this in, in, in the context of Baltimore, sometimes the post-war houses are knocked down and replaced with something that's actually nice, nicer than the previous example, but also much more expensive. And so this is a sort of question that some people are talking about a kind of suburban gentrification happening in certain communities. And so you could think about this potentially for somewhere like Worthington, right? Where are, you know, parts of Worthington where you might see uh, people really wanting to uh, move in here and changing the, uh, the actual structures. Another thing that's been happening in the suburbs is accessory dwelling units. And um, these are often sometimes called uh, backyard cottages or mother-in-laws. And this is a big thing in California um, because of their housing crisis. But also I think this has also become a movement for, for older people as we talked about this aging of the um, population. You could stay in your community and maybe living in a multi-generational sort of environment, but not actually in the same house as your kids or your grandkids, right? And you can have your own kind of space. So in, in the case of, this is sort of complicated from a planning perspective, and I'm sure Lee would have a lot to say on this, but in, in San Jose, what they've done is they've had like pre-approved vendors for this kind of development that sort of streamlines the planning process a lot um, and, and sort of they give, these plans to folks who may want to do this, and it's already pre-approved and, and the vendors are kind of already pre-approved for this. And the state of California has actually been giving a lot of grants um, for folks to be able to do this in their, in their uh, communities. So this is sort of seen as a way to help with the housing affordability problem, but also a way to help with an aging population. And then, of course, there's constant remodeling and reinvesting going on in our housing stock. You see that around Worthington for sure. It looks the same on the outside, but there's been new bathrooms, new whatever. It's a constant kind of reinvestment happening. So, so suburbs are, while they're changing, they're also staying the same, but maybe better, right, in terms of their reinvestment. So one thing I want to sort of talk about is how all, what, what is really kind of been happening in terms of how people are seeing their communities. And every um, few years, the National um, 
Association of Realtors does a survey to ask people what their preferences are for the kinds of communities they want to live in. Surveys generally show that people still do value the low density suburban life, right? But there is an increasing demand uh, amongst people, particularly retired baby boomers and younger households for more compact development, maybe smaller yards, smaller housing, right? And people are actually willing to take a smaller house for walkability and amenities, right? So there's a broader kind of public support for walkable spaces and uh, that's really um, uh, growing. And in the urban planning context, we talk about this a lot to the students. We are training them in ways to think about density, to think about walkability, to think about these things because the impacts on the environment, for example, we could maybe walk more and drive less, right? These are all, um, we, we could have denser living for housing affordability issues, but also to prevent sprawl from continuing to go out into the kind of rural areas and that, that has economic or, um, environmental benefits too. So what does this really mean, these changing preferences then for the traditional suburb? And so some people are really going oh, well into this of redesigning and retrofitting these suburban communities. And um, there's this, this book here on retrofitting suburbia looks at hundreds of examples of this happening across the United States. And lots of suburbs are really doing this. And what they're doing over time is really a few things. They're reusing, adapting uh, the reuse of older retail spaces that are sort of dying kind of malls and introducing maybe public facilities into those. They're regreening, getting rid of large parking lots, for example, right? Because they have ecological benefits to get to doing that. It's good for water quality and so on. And then they're actually transforming a lot of single use um, uh, development into more mixed use configurations. So a good example of this might be somewhere like, this is actually a photograph of Towson in Maryland, which actually did the same thing. But think of Dublin as being a real example of what they've done on Bridge Street um, as, a, as a classic case of a kind of suburban retrofit. Another thing that's been happening as well, and I think in the suburban context, there was public housing in suburbs. I don't think people, people realize that um, historically. And unfortunately, in some ways, what's happened in some of these cases, as they've aged, as some of those units have aged, they've actually knocked them down and put in a kind of newer developments that tend to be a lot more market rate right? So they may tend to kind of um, not have as many subsidized units as they had in the past. So you could think about this in terms of, say, the National Church Residence, right? What's happening there? You're losing some subsidized units because you've had to introduce uh, more mixed market rate development. So this, I think, is, uh, is also happening. So what's kind of missing from the picture, I think? So in some ways, a lot of this retrofitting, a lot of this redevelopment, apart from maybe the accessory dwelling units, it's not necessarily targeting the issue of housing affordability too much. And it's certainly not thinking about the way in which we might have neighborhood disparity regionally when we think of things in a regional context. So we know that the housing market's really taking off, right? We know this is happening uh, nationally. And these are year to year over year, 16% increases in the sales price of homes um, just over this past uh, from January to kind of March. And this is kind of increasing and going, um, going to kind of increase in the future too. A lot of this too, we're seeing soaring kind of housing prices also increasing our rents. And so we're seeing a kind of um, uh, effect there too, not just in, in the housing, but in the, or just in home ownership, but also in rental. And one of the things that's been interesting about rental um, in more recent years is that higher income households are renting um, and the growth in rental amongst that higher income group is sort of driving a little bit of this uh, increase in price in, in rentals nationally. Um, so I think you guys have done a, maybe a session about housing affordability before, but this just to remind those that may have not been part of that, 
what you technically call unaffordable housing, if you like, is if you're paying more than 30% of your income on housing, you're seen as cost burdened, right? And you're seen as having not being living in affordable housing. And you're severely cost burdened if you're paying more than 50% of your income on housing. So the share of these cost burdened folks are generally low income individuals, right? And that's persistently been the case um, those at the lowest um, income levels are the ones that are the most cost burdened. But you can see here that even those folks that are kind of in that 45, 30 to, uh, to 45 or 45 are, are starting to see uh, those going up too in terms of being cost burdened. One of the things that's uh, important to kind of realize, and there's been some question about how we're measuring this kind of affordability issue, um, People cut back on other things when they don't have enough for rent, right? So they cut back on medical issues, they cut back on energy, they cut back on other things when they can't afford uh, the rent. So another thing to, to think about here in terms of housing affordability is that there are folks that are um, income eligible for certain subsidies, federal subsidies, who don't actually ever receive them because there's just not enough of them, right? So these folks are relying on the private market system to try to get housing. They're not getting any kind of subsidies at all. So I think this is something to think about in the, as well. And what I've talked about is really uh, maybe at the lowest income folks are struggling the most, but I think it's also a range of people, right? And so, well, and, we're, and Columbus has done a kind of um, looked at, at this issue and they found that 54,000 uh, low income households pay more than half their income and they're uh, there's not enough affordable units. There's sort of lack of about 54,000 of these for the low, lowest income folks. But there's also others that need affordable housing, right? And it's people that are not, there's those that are on the lowest end, but those that are kind of also maybe 80 to 120% of the median family incomes that are still struggling uh, with affordability. And this is folks who are teachers um, and so on. So what does this all mean too, in terms of, so this housing affordability is, is it was one thing, but there's also questions of disparities, right, across a region and that sort of neighborhood disparities. And one of the things that's really important that they've talked about in research is that there are effects to being uh, living in, in areas of poverty or concentrated poverty uh, and, and where you live has real impacts on your kind of future. And so an example here for a third grader, the impact of living in a very high, severely disadvantaged neighborhood is equivalent to missing one grade of school. So place kind of matters, right? And um, the housing matters, right, for your health. So if you just even move people into nicer housing, that has a real effect on their health. And then there's health impacts also at a kind of neighborhood scale. So places where you see exposure to violence or you see issues of like not having enough tree canopy to think to keep things cooler right the, the heat island effect is more severe in like poorer neighborhoods and, and those neighborhoods that don't have enough uh, um, of that critical kind of infrastructure so we've helped impacts at the neighborhood scale so the question's kind of moving forward as you guys have been really kind of talking about these questions, talking about these issues, right, is to sort of say, well, we, we're seeing a lot of change that's happening just generally in terms of the suburbs, the aging, and more diversity, and so on. Um, but how will Worthington prepare kind of for that change that's, com that's coming, right? Um, and that is, may not, um, we may not see, um, we're going to be seeing a lot of this with, with Intel coming in and all of these things that are happening. How's Worthington going to prepare for that? And what should it do about housing affordability? And what is Worthington's kind of responsibility then to the kind of larger region when you start to think about these neighborhood disparities? And so the effects of living in different uh, kinds of neighborhoods and whether or not we should be opening up uh, this suburb to those who may be in uh, more disadvantaged places. So I'll leave it there and thank you.
Okay, um, so I think we have a little shifting to do. So online people, bear with us for a moment. You're not going to hear anything for a second, but then we're just going to switch cameras. Sorry, I needed to tell them That's that. That's okay. Um, but first, we'll be uh, taking some questions from the audience, and um, we have both live and online potentially. I don't know, uh, Lennon, if you had questions you wanted to pose, or should we start with the live audience? Uh, we have a comment. I can read the comment if you want. Um, thank you for this presentation. It is very important to tell the story of why we need inclusive housing in Worthington. I am surprised that some people in our community do not understand why different people make in terms of income and our housing stock is a mismatch. We can and need to do better. Um, well, I'll ask you a question and you all can think about it. Our folks online, but I noticed uh, when you went through the neighborhood Yes. So much of it can be residential. 
And you see that that change the field working components, but they're going to start stacking income tax increases because that changes the dynamic of a vertical. That's been interesting. I think you know, every Monday at council, one of our finance directors usually mentioning those type of things. At least as of right now, we've not seen that impact with working components because a lot of people that come into our community during the day of work, a couple of weeks. So at least as of last Monday, I'm at our council meeting, we have not seen that. I think it's always on the back of line. Can you guys all please speak louder and clearer so that folks online can better hear you? So I had a question. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the you reference the the voting codes, reference one, right? The last one. So that's just in years. Just like with the well, with the year. So what do you see as something that should change? In that? I think one of the things that we've seen that. The best plan practice is usually to a land use plan or a neighborhood plan or a quarter plan. Usually it makes recommendations of how you should adjust your zoning code. So I think what we've tried to do over the past several years is the existing planning documents we have in place is to modify our zoning to meet the intent of that. So one of the things that um, myself and my staff worked on um, in our office of Tara was the Wilson Drove Corridor Plan. It was really to Build off of what the planning document was, what we want to envision it in five, 10, 20 years out from now, but looked at how do you make the zoning, put the zoning code, the development guidelines in place so that as those properties are developed, it's set to go. So, would you it may make changes to at least that post of the plan to match up our own plans to Brian. be ready and prepared? Um, I think with the code in 1971, there's still a lot of room and a lot of funds that it needs to really. You know, updated terminology that someone's you know, tweet. But as usually when you do land use plans, you try to make modifications to your to match up with the questions. So we're going to go to online, give the chance to ask mm -hmm. some questions. Go ahead, Lennon. And so this question is very aligned kind of with the that question. It's where do the presenters see opportunities to change the built environment in Worthington to be more diverse and inclusive? Uh, to be a more diverse and inclusive community, given that most of the community is already developed, what strategies can the city pursue that would help create opportunities for a wider variety of housing stock? And so this can be broader than zoning itself as well. And all panelists are welcome to answer. Loud. Um, buildings, uh, those, um, you know, how 
having to split with having to determine the cost of those and you know, all of that sort of thing. Um, it's not a it's, it's a complicated issue, but um <laughs> Wouldn't it also depend on if the unit was attached to the house or not, and who the owner of the accessory unit was? So and if, you, wouldn't it also depend on if the accessory unit was attached? Because you can do accessory dwelling units attached to a structure, right. and you can do them detached. Right. Or you, I mean, who owns the? You could sell an accessory dwelling unit, or you could write a regulation that requires. The owner of the original parcel to also own the accessory dwelling unit and rent it and maybe have it under one cat. I think it depends on how you write the legislation. Yeah, I know in my, my previous life, um, the few network before they had accessory dwelling units, they called them grading flats, and it was you know, traditionally used in the zoning code district and it had to be a family member. But I think us as planners, you looked at okay, if you're building this, you're putting an investment into it, it would be five years, five days, or you know, 20 years out, you have this unit there, what are you going to be able to use it for in the future? Um, I think the, the idea when we first put it in there was really to you know, have that ability for a, a family member, but it led into a, a greater conversation of well, would it really matter if it's my mother or my sister or a family member that, that needed to live there or anyone mm -hmm. needed to live there, what was the difference? And I think, you know, at least with that, I know it was taxed on the improvements you know, for the property, but it had a unit, but it had that other unit that it added on to, so it, it, it was hot, um, but then it, it did go into looking at, like you said, where I looked at where I worked before, it was much larger lot sizes. So I think when you look at our community, there's probably certain neighborhoods it'd be easier to happen, yeah, um, and then not so much. But I think it's also what you think of size wise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the example the bird of that showed it looks smaller, it looked maybe you know 200 square feet versus mm -hmm. 300 square feet, it's much smaller. Where you know a lot of our community members may not be able to fit in that. Um, Stafford Village, when it was rebuilt, those units were 200, 300 square feet size, more ADA compliant. So you're trying to figure out what size you actually need and what size you actually need to live in. Does it need to really be that big? You know, maybe not. And for our community, if we go down that path, that needs to be that true discussion of what fits Worthington. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, when you look at any other communities, any other code, there's not a one size fits all. You kind of have to figure out and tailor your regulations to what your community can handle, what they'll live with. You know, it may push the boundaries a little bit at times, but you know, figure out that balance. Mm -hmm. Do we have? I do have another question online. online. Okay. Yeah, how does the underlying structure of a city's tax base affect its built environment? What challenges do cities like Worthington face in remaining financially strong? And does density help attract business income? <laughs> okay, so at least in Ohio, you know, your municipalities rely on income tax. So uh, the question that Bill on earlier was, you know, have we seen a, an adjustment with our income tax intake? You know, with the pandemic, we've not at this point. But for all of the services that we provide our residents, we need the income tax. So that's why usually as planners or communities, you look at where those doctors, those lawyers, those big income producing jobs. But you also have to balance it with the retail needs, you know, whether it's a 14 hour, you know, $14 an hour job that you need for those services for your community. But usually you need to rely on income tax. So until that kind of gets figured out, a good way to rely on income tax, you're always going to kind of try to figure out that balance. Um, you know, I think with some of the improvements we've done around the mall area, one of the things that we wanted to do with the boosting housing to that area was really trying to figure out that mix of uses where you have the retail, you have the office, you have that residential that you could kind of walk and everything, you know, make it a little bit easier to do it. I think some employers, some, you know, employees look for that. We don't have a lot of that, so we're still very car dependent. Um, we have walkability to a certain point, but a lot of what we have right now, care for car dependence. It's um, random, it's just our process. Anyone else want to comment? Uh, I mean, overall, it's a good story from this. You know, it's better than I can do. I can please the same thing on this topic, but overall, it's in, you know, it was really in the combined community that needed some um, revenue. And so part of the strategy was to earn more employment. Um, a hotel, a hotel tax, 
Um, so if you have money at ways to read about so as to boost their taxes, because a lot of their property tax is going to the school system, not to infrastructure or aging infrastructure. Well, and I think the more expensive housing becomes in the community, I think it's San Francisco, where you've got um, really expensive housing. And if you need people to do things to work in the community, um, they have to get there. And that's really a challenge. And I think even employers, from what I heard um, in Central Ohio, they want to minimize that and they want their employees to be able to get to work. Um, so, you know, the closer they can go to work, the better. So, that's what I'm hearing and how I'm thinking about looking at these issues. Yes. Yeah, uh, no, but just wanted to say a, a question. I think the conversation that uh, Lee was talking about with excessive volume and smell kind of thing. I think that would be a great subject as part of the housing study and an update to a comprehensive plan. So I just want to get that out there. Uh, and then, so I do have a question for Dr. Hamlin. I think this is something you touched on a little bit in your presentation. I didn't know if you wanted to spend maybe another minute or two getting into it. You mentioned that there are uh, environmental stewardship benefits to building a little bit denser housing, especially with regard to potentially replacing squall, whether that's because you infill development as opposed to building the exits or whatever it has to be. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that and kind of, you know, tell us what kind of environmental stewardship benefits you might have from uh, increasing density? Yeah, so, um, I mean, there's a lot of work on this effects of the environment. So, um, density can help with, you know, well, there's a couple of things that density can do. So, um, can prevent Development of the third eye, right? It can also help if you want to do public transportation. So if you start to have a little more density, public transportation starts to get a little more sense, right? A lot more people might start to use it. That's the environment, right? Not too much. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the retrofitting that's been going on has been also around these parking lots. And so these things are really not good and in the mass amount of Surfaces because you get a green that comes back to those surfaces and actually go right into the storm volumes and it's really not good for our water quality. So you start to introduce um, more green spaces around the events of the data centers that can be back in the heritage. So, yeah, I think on the driving side, you know, the water quality is going to take us a little bit. We have time for one more. Yes. Didn't you, I guess we heard about this in like Southern and Southern Houston, and Houston had the public transit essentially forced people to use public transit. Like, is that, would you think that's a feasible idea in some parts of like Columbus? I've heard a lot of talk about doing that, like short north, like downtown area, where you know, like you could feasibly, this was a higher density there, you could, you know, essentially make people walk and take a bus instead. So how, how would they be? Like how, how would they make them? <laughs> so the, the main thing I heard about is like in some European cities like Amsterdam or like Barcelona started to do this in like large areas now. Because apparently like the city governments have just been like, okay, well we're just gonna ban X amount of cars in this area during the week, or say like cars just can't drive on the street anymore. And that was resulted in like Amsterdam, especially, is people are starting to bike everywhere now, right? And like you see these pictures of like the 1970s, right? These streets were filled with cars, right? They had a car culture in Amsterdam. And then the Amsterdam government was basically just like, this is not working, this is terrible. We essentially are just going to make cars and make streets and whatnot. And now there's this culture of biking there that did not exist. Like Amsterdam, you know. Is this like really a unique case in a team in a lot of ways? You guys don't know, right? But yeah, you know, <laughs> you're like in the sense of, yeah, now it's more of a biking city. And it's also far more dense than like Columbus. But I think in like a city like New York or Philadelphia, even 
uh, and kind of like induce in them, you know, like making people walk more or taking a bike or using public transit is probably a better solution than what we currently have. Yeah, so I think that I've seen what you're talking about in Barcelona, they've, they've started to block off streets and cars. I mean, um, I mean, it's difficult to do. You have to be very careful about how you do it, right? But you could, you know, places like Shoreline or other places might be able to direct traffic some of the parts, right? And have sections of the city that might be um, more walkable or force people to walk. Um, it's, it's it's challenging, you know, you know, we've got like parking regulations, things like that, you know, zoning code that any development has to have so much parking associated with it. So it, it's the things that have to change, I think, um, to make that happen. May I say something about that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that that's incredibly difficult in the United States to become a rule. And because of how planning is not centralized in many European countries, planning is much more centralized. And cities have a lot less autonomy over what is allowed within their borders and what, like, they don't they don't get to control zoning the way that we do in the United States. And so I think that that alone would make that on a regional scale close to impossible at this moment. It would take years to get there, but it took them years to get there too, I would point out. Um, but I think that home rule would make that very difficult. But you are seeing that on small scales in certain cities. There are places where they're closed certain streets. And they just close them permanently and are turning them into other things. But I think on a large scale, that'd be incredibly difficult because of the way we do land use planning in the United States, how localized it is. Well, I'll just say. And uh, politicians don't have books, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I mean, I, my day job, I work with the area agencies on aging. And so we're talking about how to ensure our communities are accommodating to all of us as we age. Aging and it's so cool, we're all doing it. Um, but <laughs> they have to really think about that for our future. And people don't want to drive. I was on this call this morning um, with uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation. It's a coalition to talk about older driver safety. And one of the big pushes is increasing alternative transportation options walking, biking, you know, shuttles, things like that. Uh, public transit, yeah, absolutely. We need to do more of that. Really and we have one vote on the line that part, comes up that's part, so. not, um, you know, I don't think it's yeah, frequent yeah, enough. Yeah, I used to take people to go downtown all the time. Um, and, you know, our bus shelters are not existing. We're getting another one soon. Um, but so our own community, even just looking at terms of age friendly, should be doing better and just have those alternative options. And then hopefully, you know, people will start taking advantage of that as well. So I think that was a great question. So we are uh, out of time. Um, this was a great conversation. I want to thank all of our speakers tonight. I think they did a fantastic job. I want to thank all of you for coming to this. Our um, goal with this is to continue these conversations in the community. We all need to be talking about these issues. As you've heard, Intel is coming. We have other things that we want to accomplish. We need to be ready. We want to be a diverse community. So all of these discussions, and we certainly want to be prepared for as we're all aging. So we want to be uh, having these discussions and really we can come up with solutions. They may be challenging. We have a lot of great power here in the community. We can figure this stuff out. So I want to thank you for coming tonight. I want to thank our sponsors, which are on the slide. Um, and we are planning more sessions related to the subject later this year. I uh, hope you will be able to join us. And please check the City of Wellington's website. There is um, a project page for building a piece of community. And I think um, Brenda can put that in the chat, really. Um, and then, uh, building a piece of communities has its own website that's also there posting things that you can use up to date. And one thing I want to say, because I can't get up with that many questions. So I'm just going to a plug though, because the Wigginton Historical Society is amazing. Yeah. And she gave us a great job of sharing the history of Wigginton. And I, I encourage you to go to Wigginton um, history.org, right? Um, and check out the website.